This video is sponsored by Gentle Bands. This camera is unlike any other camera you've probably seen before, and when this thing was first launched, a lot of people thought that this technology was going to completely turn the world of photography on its head. But even with $40 million worth of investment backing the company behind it, and a huge amount of media hype surrounding the camera's development, ultimately it completely failed, meaning that these days not many people have even heard of it. So what exactly is it, what makes it so different, and why did it flop harder than a fat dude? at a swimming pool. Well, this is the Elytro Alum, and despite its futuristic looks, this was actually released 10 years ago in 2014. Now, despite it looking like a standard mirrorless camera, this is actually called a light field camera. Now, we'll discuss what exactly a light field camera is and how it functions a little bit later on, but first we need to talk about why this thing was just so revolutionary. Now, as we all know, when you take a photo with just about any conventional type of camera, firstly, the autofocus system will attempt to lock on to the desired subject, and then afterwards it will record the image and if everything goes according to plan your subject will be nice and sharp and in focus and the photo will look just as good as you hoped. However as we all know this doesn't always go to plan and if the autofocus doesn't lock on correctly or your subject moves out of the way at the last minute then this can result in a blurred or out of focus image resulting in a photo that's ultimately ruined because there's no real way of fixing it afterwards. Well that's unless you own a light field camera because this allows you to adjust the focus of your photos after you've taken them. This camera also allows you to alter the depth of field too. And by that, I mean you can either add more blur to the background or increase the depth of field so that you have everything sharp and in focus. So in theory, this technology means that you no longer have to even worry about focusing or committing to a specific aperture when taking photos because all of that can be decided way later on in the future. So already you can probably see why a lot of people thought that this was going to be a total game changer for the future of photography. Now for a camera that was developed back in 2014, I think this has a pretty remarkable looking design and it really wouldn't look out of place next to cameras that were released this year, let alone 10 years ago. On the back it has a huge 4 inch tiltable touchscreen which is the primary means of controlling this camera, though there are of course some physical buttons and dials too, including two command dials and a small selection of shortcut buttons. Now you've probably already noticed this absolutely ginormous lens on the front. Well this is actually fixed in place so you can't remove it and change it out like you would do on a mirrorless camera or a DSLR despite it being as large as either of those. But honestly you probably wouldn't want to change this lens because it offers an 8 times optical zoom which has a full frame equivalent field of view of a 30 to 250 millimeter lens with a fixed aperture of f2. That's pretty wild. Now as the aperture of this lens is locked in at f2 there's obviously no aperture priority mode. Instead this is substituted for an ISO priority mode displayed as an I allowing you to dial in your desired ISO sensitivity whilst the camera takes care of the shutter speed. However, just because this lens is locked into an aperture of f2, it doesn't mean that you can only capture images with a very shallow depth of field, because remember, the depth of field is something that can be altered after the photo has been taken. This can be previewed on the camera by simply rotating two fingers on the touchscreen, allowing you to adjust it from an equivalent of f1 to f16. Now, although I said earlier that you can adjust the focus point after the image has been captured, this camera does still have its limitations. To help you better understand which areas of a scene can can be set as a focal point later on. Pressing this button will bring up a kind of heat map type overlay which works in a very similar way to focus peaking on more modern cameras. The main difference being that the objects that are highlighted in orange show the furthest focusing distance whilst the blue highlight represents the closest focusing distance. Essentially anything that doesn't have either a blue or an orange halo will be permanently out of focus no matter where you shift the focus point later on. So because of this you will still need to focus at least somewhere within the ballpark in order to guarantee that you can assign sharp focus to your subject later on. This lens also has a minimum focusing distance of just three centimeters, which means it's pretty good for taking close-up macro shots too. Huh, well, would you look at that? That perfectly segues us into talking about today's sponsor, Gentle Bands. Gentle Bands create beautifully crafted rings for men in a ton of unique designs and unconventional material choices, including dinosaur bones, meteorite, aged whiskey barrels, and even guitar strings. Now, I opted for the lava, which is predominantly made from from tungsten but also includes both gold and whiskey barrel inlays which I think makes this look super slick and it would even be a great choice as a wedding band. They're also currently offering a free engraving service so naturally I had to take 
advantage of this too. Now when the ring arrived it actually came in this really nice packaging which means that this would also be a great gift idea for friends and family. But what happens if you have a hands-on job and can't always wear a ring on your finger? Well Gentle Bands has you covered there too because they also offer a range of stainless steel chains to let you show off your ring at all times. Here I've decided to pair the Freya ring with this black chain as I think the simplicity of these two items pair really nicely together. Be sure to check out Gentle Bands exclusive range of rings using the link in the description below and also receive 25% off your order using the discount code TOM25. And thanks again to Gentle Bands for supporting this channel by sponsoring this video. So anyway, how does this camera actually work? Well, needless to say, light-filled cameras are extremely complex and I can barely tie my own shoes, let alone explain in detail the complexities of this engineering feat. So I'll leave a link up here to a video that attempts to explain all of that in greater detail if you are interested. But in very basic layman's terms, just for the purpose of this video, behind this lens, there's something called a micro lens array or MLA for short. An MLA is essentially an imaging sensor that is covered in lots of tiny lenses. These tiny lenses not only allow the sensor to establish much more information about the scene it's capturing, but crucially it captures the scene from multiple slightly different viewpoints all at the same time. The camera's processor can then use all of this information to create a single image that is made up of thousands of sub-images. This Lytro Alum is able to capture information from 40 million individual light rays, or as Lytro like to call them, 40 mega rays. I know this isn't quite the same as megapixels, but we'll come onto that a little bit later on. Anyway, what matters for now is that it's this MLA system that allows the camera to create those refocusing, depth of field, and 3D moving effects that we've discussed. Now, although all of those things are certainly very helpful in a practical sense, where I think this camera gets really interesting as a unique creative tool is the concept of creating living pictures. But in order to do that, you need to first download the Lytro desktop software. And from here, not only can you edit your photos using most of the same sliders you'll be familiar with if you use Lightroom, stuff like exposure, contrast, color options, etc. You can also adjust the depth of field here too. But once you've done that, you can head down to the animate section and you can actually use keyframes to animate the focal plane, giving this kind of cool effect. Now, back in the day, you were able to even host your images on the Lytro website and then the viewer could interact with your photos, allowing them to shift the focal plane by simply clicking on the photo, as well as creating that 3D effect by clicking and dragging. And this gave artists a really unique interactive means of storytelling, which was kind of unlike anything else at the time. But of course, these days, the Lytro website is very much dead and gone. So to my knowledge, this is no longer an option. However, you can still export your keyframed image as an MP4 video file and use that instead, which obviously isn't quite as fun or interactable as a living picture, but it's still a cool effect to play around with. Now, although the Lytro desktop editing software has long since been abandoned, you can thankfully still download it for free via an archiving website. So there are clearly a number of benefits to having a camera like this. So why didn't the technology take off? Well, honestly, there are a long list of reasons. Firstly, at launch, this was pretty pricey, retailing at just under $1,600. Thankfully, these days you can pick them up for a lot cheaper. And I bought mine in excellent condition on eBay for around £300, which equates roughly to just under $400. When Lytro released this camera, they were aiming squarely at pro photographers. But personally, I think they just completely misjudged the demand for this type of product in the professional world. I mean, if you are a professional photographer, focusing a camera properly really shouldn't be a problem for you. So having to set the focus after the image has been taken just adds another largely unnecessary step. Plus, a year prior to this camera being released, Canon debuted its dual pixel AF technology on the Canon 70D, which dramatically improved the hit rate for digital cameras, once again making this light field technology kind of less relevant. Secondly, the final images this thing creates have a resolution of just 4 megapixels, and even by 2014 standards, that was pretty low. Now, just to put that into some context, the Canon 1200D was released the same year as this, and that could capture 18 megapixel raw photos as well as HD video for just $550, and that included an 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens. Speaking of raw, the files created by this camera suffer from pretty poor dynamic range, a bunch of weird artifacting effects created as a result of using an MLA, and when capturing more intricate scenes, the camera will often misinterpret the depth of certain objects, and in order to fix this, you have to manually edit the depth map in Photoshop, which is just way more effort than it's worth. Plus, the files you capture can only be edited using the dedicated Lytro software, which is pretty basic, slow to render, and prone to crashing. Unfortunately, though, I think the final knife in the back for this camera was the rapid advancement in smartphone technology. Around the same time that this camera was released, HTC launched the One M8 with its dual
dual camera technology. And this allowed you to blur the background of your portraits after the photo was taken in a very similar way as this Lytro. And those images were the same 4 megapixel resolution as this, though the big difference of course being that it was on a phone that you could fit in your pocket. This not so much. I've got something in my front pocket for you. A few years later, Apple advanced this technology further by adding it into the iPhone 7, and from that point forward, it became the norm for phones to feature multiple lenses, and along with it, the ability to provide post-production trickery. But despite its shortcomings, I still think it's a fascinating piece of technology that just goes to show that innovation isn't always enough to guarantee success.